Okay, so <laughs> no no fancy openings this week. Uh, not a lot of uh, capability to do a lot of that stuff. I'm, I'm literally on suitcases <laughs> as I'm traveling in Japan right now. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Holy cow, we have got a show for you tonight. Now, it's early in the morning uh, right now in Japan. It's actually 10.30 a.m. Of, on the AMs. And uh, we're going to be doing this live show. Welcome, everybody. Is everything coming across uh, clearly? Everything sound good? Leave leave that in the chat, please. Uh, comment in the chat. Tell me if the sound is good, if everything's working out all right. Uh, hello, Clydesters, <laughs> says Kathy in the chat. Welcome. Welcome. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've been looking forward to this. And, you know, of course... You know, apologies, I haven't been able to put out the kind of content that I normally do. And it's, of course, because I'm traveling, I'm on vacation, and I'm spending time with family. I'm doing all this uh, other stuff. So I'm sure you guys are okay with that. Um, but in the meantime, I do love to keep it sick. Even if uh, I'm not, you know, it's not the evening for me here, I'm not having wobbly pops with you guys. Uh, I just had a coffee, you know, that kind of thing. But it's a lot of fun, and I'm, I'm excited about this. Uh, yeah, leave me a comment. Uh, perfect sound, Japan man and his Canadian master plan. Yeah, that's right. That's right. My Canadian master plan. We'll see. We'll see what ends up happening with that noob. I might be coming stateside and living living on your side of the the uh, the border. I mean, what do you say to that? Uh, who knows? Who knows what's gonna be happening uh, coming in the in the months ahead literally right now it's it's hilarious i've got this makeshift uh i wish i could show you what what i'm looking at i have three suitcases here <laughs> my camera computer uh makeshift extra monitor just so i can look at this stuff and i've got you know keyboards just sitting on stuff a mouse on my knee uh yeah just making this work just totally making this work uh let's let's have some fun <laughs> with this one no asahi 10 30 in the morning no no i'm not <laughs> i know it's vacation but i think you got to set a limit at some point i think even on vacation it's got to be like oh, like three o'clock come on you, you got to wait till at least three o'clock something like that <laughs> that's that is a thing let me pull up the the chat in another window so i can i can see it better uh, bring ma bring maple syrup, yeah, to Japan or from home, or oh, to America. That's right. You guys have plenty of maple. That's that's such a funny thing. Um, if you jump on the U.S., jump to the U.S., please touch bases with Viva Fry. Uh, I've already touched bases with Viva Fry. Um, I, there was a, a bit of an exchange there. I wanted to talk to him before I left for Japan. He got busy, and I was like, okay, well, I'll talk to you when I get back. Um, we'll get things going. Uh, it, okay, if you if you're tuning in and you're wondering why I'm talking about this, so you haven't heard anything about this yet. Um, in Canada, uh, where I live on the West Coast, uh, I'm going to be losing my my rental, my rental, the property that I I rent for my family to live in, and because of that, uh, moving back into you know going into the market of trying to rent another uh, home for us. It's going to be a, either a massive downsize, a uh, massive increase, actually probably both, a uh, downsize and a massive increase in, in price, uh, cost of living. And um, in the town that I live in, it just does not look feasible. It doesn't look feasible at all. There are some temporary measures that I can, I can take uh, that I think you know, we're, we're going to do. Because I want to, I want to make sure that my my daughter gets to finish her school year. Like it's so abrupt, so abrupt these things, right? And and they hit you hard. And you know what do you what do you do? You're gonna just complain about it? No, we're gonna we're gonna turn this into a giant opportunity. That's that's what's gonna happen. But um, I don't want to turn it into uh, a way to impoverish my family. Like that that trying to stay put. That's what that's gonna be. So we're trying to look at it pragmatically. Um, and it, it looks like uh, anywhere we move in Canada is going to largely be the same, or we'll be living in the tundra. <laughs> That's essentially the way it's going to go. I am an, I'm an American citizen. Uh, I, I have my U.S. passport, uh, social security number, all that stuff, as well as uh, my wife's from Japan. So there, there's options over here as well, and we're, we're looking into all this stuff while we're while we're here. So we're not sure what's going to happen. Um, 
keep everyone posted, of course, over the course of the summer. We're going to find uh, something uh, transitory, something that we can uh, temporarily squish ourselves into. Uh, literally, it's going to be like that. It's going to be one of those, we're going to find a some some you know sardine can to uh, stuff our family into and all of our belongings for uh, a, a temporary amount of time until we figure things out. I feel so bad for you, Clyde. Listen, don't feel bad for me. There's so many people in this situation, right? Like I'm, I'm actually in 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 a pretty good circumstance because because I have a, a you know dual citizenship with the United States. My wife's from Japan, so we have we have options. The people that feel bad for the people who are in Canada, they don't have an out. Um, like even if you look at the you know immigrants, recent immigrants that have come to Canada. Even they have an out. They they can go back. There's so many people that have come from India, and, and I'm, I'm not picking on India by any any means, but you know, uh, a huge a huge proportion of the people who have come recently have come from India into Canada, and a lot of them are going back, and a lot of them are saying life was better in India. So, but what about for the Canadians? What about for the Canadians? Life life is better where? where like what what choices do a lot of canadians have and this is why i say you know i'll make things work and and things things will turn out good and please, please don't worry about me um yeah it'll be tough it's it's not none of these things are ever really easy but i can turn this into a giant opportunity what i what, the people i feel sorry for are canadians who don't have anywhere else they can go um perhaps don't have don't have family in any other areas uh, and and that that's really sad. That really is sad, and we're seeing it in the forms of tent cities all over. Canada. Disconnected is the um, is the stream going okay? Are we are we uploading? Oh no! Please wait while we reconnect to you. Uh, hopefully it does reconnect. This is interesting. Let me see here. I got chat here. Okay, the chat's back successfully reconnected i wonder oh okay i hope i hope this doesn't happen a lot so um <laughs> i'm at my i'm at my uh the the family residence and you know it's kind of it's kind of potato internet it's not the best internet so <laughs> we'll see how this goes wow okay uh we're getting i think are we getting a backlog of a backlog of internet stuff um okay it's buffering for some people in and out uh, you are buffering a bit, but it's okay. We understand. Okay, well, let's see, <laughs> let's see how it how it could go. Hi, okay, all the highs in the chat. That's great. Sounds good. Just picture lags. Unfortunate, very unfortunate. G Meister with the five dollar super chat. Don't forget to hit the like button. Life will get better after Trudy. <laughs> right? Stream is glitchy at times. Yeah. Okay. So the stream's a bit glitchy. Um, yeah, potato internet buffering glitchy. Let me try to let me try to uh, fix something because last time we were having this issue with Marty and um, it was because the modem was uh, we got a modem on the other side of the place and it's just it's concrete walls. Now it's uh, it's a thing in Japan. The buildings are concrete. They because there's so many earthquakes over here, they don't mess around with building buildings. There's not just like drywall between between rooms. Uh, there, there's often concrete walls and structure between rooms, and it's uh, it's one of those keeps freezing. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something to the modem, and I'll be back in like two seconds here. Hopefully that fixes the issue. That would be good if that's the case. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how that works out. Uh, chat's going good still. Um, Clyde is from the future, so lag is on our end. Yeah, right. It is actually 10:40 a.m. 
Saturday. So <laughs> you guys, you guys are way in the past. I'm way, I'm way ahead of you. I'm way, way ahead of you uh, on this. And not, not only that, I'm using a laptop and I have a whole lot of stuff going on. So hopefully, um, hopefully in the future, I'm going to try to figure something out because I'm going to be doing a lot of these um, things on the go moving forward because of the whole housing situation on, on my end. So I'm going to have to uh, figure out a better a better connection. We might be moving into a place that has, uh, that has, uh, that was, what's the, uh, what's Elon Musk's internet? I keep forgetting the name, Starlink. Uh, so Starlink will be my, my next internet connection uh, in Canada. Because I, I might have to, I might actually have to go find, like live in a place out in the woods. Not kidding. Not kidding. Um, as a temporary <laughs> measure, but this is this is the world we live in. It's so crazy. Um, what's the lottery numbers, Clyde? Yeah, right, right. Oh, it's yeah, it's it's weird being over here uh, the next day in the morning. Um, that's the thing, and we've got so much going on right now. Like the my my wife is off at a wedding party, uh, which is the reason why we came at this time of year. Uh, she got invited to this wedding party and it was, it was just an invitation for her. So I'm, I'm here with the kids. Kids are watching some, uh, some cartoons. And then afterwards we're going to be going out to the park. That's uh, that's the thing. During your Japan tour, someone said that houseboats in Squamish are very affordable and well decked out. Mm, that's not, not so accurate. So it's mooring, mooring costs are really, really expensive if you can even get in. There's a wait list to get into any of that stuff. Chippy's outdoors with a ten dollars super chat. Quit rationing, Clyde. Hit that thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No more rationing. Get in there and uh, hit that thumbs up. I don't even know where we're at yet uh, with that. I'm gonna. I might have to close off some of these windows that I have going to keep track of this stuff. Um, unfortunately, that's just. Uh, it's just the way it works. Open the widget for that thing. Okay, I'm just gonna close this win that window for the time being. Uh, close some of this other stuff, and because my computer's actually lagging, it's not just the internet. So, um, well, I will have to get through some of these uh, some of these things that I wanted to talk about uh, because I need to close some of the tabs. I'm not on my big computer at home, which has tons and tons of uh, RAM and has tons and tons of uh, capacity for for all of that stuff. So uh, yeah, unfortunately can't do that. Sarah Allen with the 699 Super Chat. Canada is oppressive. My husband and I own a business. We struggle and I feel like uh, we'll never get ahead here uh, researching the best place to blow out to. Yeah. Um, that That... It depends depends on a lot of your options on that. Now, I want to say I, I'd love to say stay in Canada. That's the best bet. Um, I think a lot of people are jumping ship and and waiting for Canada to become you know become good again. You know, it's it's one of those things. Uh, unfortunately, you know, if you're a business out there, then Canada, uh, and that's that's the reality of the situation. The with a with the um, the Mises school of economics calls regime uncertainty. I mean, I, I'm not being hyperbolic when I compare Canada to uh, Chavez's Venezuela. I'm I'm not being hyperbolic. I'm being serious in saying that because, uh, you know, what Chavez did, it, it didn't start off with him nationalizing everything. It didn't start there. It started with a lot of the other rhetoric that came first. And then those, 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 those moves came after economic failure after economic failure because of, of that stuff. So that, this might be a way to dip yourself into uh, other markets or find a way to get into another country, uh, especially if you have your own business. And if your business, you can do your business online. This is the kind of thing where you can, you know, move a portion of your business, move it a bit at a time and and people find uh ways to emigrate to other countries based around that so that's an option um but i mean i'm not uh, i hate to be the one of the one of these people that encourage people to leave canada um i'm not i'm not doing that because you know we, we need people to stay in canada if i could stay in canada 
I, I would like to do that myself. But thank you, Sarah, for the super chat. Uh, Ravusades. I'm going to have to scroll back up to get that. With the $5 super chat. Uh, now Clyde doing something uh, in an eight Atco trailer in the woods. Yeah, well, that might be the case. It might look like I'm in a, in a trailer in the woods right now. I'm just in the spare room at my at my mother in law's place, and uh, that's uh, yeah. It's 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 cold in here. It's really cold. I actually have three pairs of socks on. It's uh, it got really cold in Tokyo just uh, over the past couple of days. It was so warm, it was beautiful, people were wearing t-shirts outside, and suddenly, uh, yeah, here we are, uh, freezing, freezing our butts off. Um, it's that time of year, though. It is that time of year. I always want to come in the summertime, and I I always give my wife crap over this, because we always end up coming like late winter, early spring, and I'm like, let's go in the summer. She doesn't want to go in the summer because it's so hot and humid, but Matsuri is like the best time of year. It's amazing. All the coolest things are happening in the middle of summer when it's it's super hot. It's crazy hot. Uh, the humidity factor here. Um, like if you're from southwestern Ontario, like myself, you know what heat and humidity feels like. It, it's even worse here. It's crazy. Um, but I love it. I, I still I love it. it's astonishing. So yeah, <laughs> um, here we are again in you know winter spring sort of time of year. That's uh, what do you what do you say to that? What do you say to that at all? Anyway, let's get into some of this stuff. I wanted to share this this uh, clip, and you guys have probably seen this before. If you haven't, uh, this was me just being a little tongue in cheek at the beginning of one of my shows, uh, one of my videos. This was months ago, and we'll get into why I'm showing you this in a sec. Now, before we get into today's report. I want to do a land acknowledgement. I am reporting on the lands once occupied by dinosaurs. That's correct. These majestic <laughs> creatures used to roam these lands. And since we're doing acknowledgements, why don't we go all the way back? Now, moving on to the story, the United Nations has declared that we are no longer in the era of global warming. No, we are in the era of global boiling. <laughs> so, so that was a tongue-in-cheek uh, little clip that I did. Uh, th this was a while ago, and I, like I, I just I think the the land acknowledgments are such a waste of time. Uh, you might disagree with me, or, but it, it it yeah. Anyway, I was I was making fun of that, and just the other day, you look on Twitter. Here's Elon Musk doing the same thing. We live on stolen land by we, I mean us mammals. We stole it from the dinosaurs. So uh, you know, great minds, right? No, <laughs> no, he obviously is a greater mind, but um, the 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 whole concept here is like, what, how far back do you actually go? How far back do you actually go um, in in any of this stuff? Uh, who's who's really indigenous to anything, um, and who who gets to stake a claim on any of these things, and why ipso facto do you get to uh, jump in and and say? Um, you know, land was stolen or, you know, treaties, ah, whatever. Anyway, these land acknowledgements are just annoying to say the best. But let's get into some of this. This week, this cracked me up because this was, um, of course, Alex Jones uh, <laughs> giving his endorsement for the, the you know, the, the, the guy who's going to be running for prime minister of Canada. He gives his endorsement on Twitter. And, of course... Uh, because of this, all hell breaks loose. But uh, he says he says on Twitter, he says, um, been following this guy for years and he's the real deal. Canada desperately needs a lot more leaders like him. And so does the rest of the world. So he's giving a, a you know, a, a big tip of the hat to Pierre Polyev in this tweet. And this is a tweet from Glenda M. And let's see if we can get this going here. Roll. It might surprise you to hear me say that. He's not a liberal. Liberals used to believe in liberty, and conservatives believed in, liber in conserving it. That was the common sense consensus we had in Canada. Justin Trudeau does not believe in liberty. He believes in government control. He wants to control your money. He wants to control your kids. He wants to control the economy, control your speech, control your bank account. Uh, he wants to control everything. That is illiberal. It's the opposite of liberalism. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to keep <laughs> going with the video because it's buffering. 
<laughs> and my internet's a potato today. So, I mean, we're just going to leave it at that. But so, I mean, the sentiment there, the sentiment that uh, Pierre Polyev is giving in this, and let's get back to this, um, the sentiment he's giving there is essentially, yeah, uh, the, the liberal party is not, a, is, they're not liberals anymore. And it was kind of bastardized language around a lot of this. We bastardize the language uh, when it comes to what what is what is liberal. I mean, the uh, a lot of people will scoff at the at the word liberal or scoff at people who call themselves liberals. Um, I know a lot of people that will call themselves classical liberals. Like I, I I fancy myself a liberal in the sense of like Thomas Paine or Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, these these guys these guys were liberals. Those guys were the original uh, liberals uh, to bring you know uh, <laughs> liberty to uh, America, uh, Canada. We've we've had you know classical liberal thinkers for for uh, generations, and this is this is not where the, you know the contemporary use of the word liberal means anymore. Most people when they when they speak of liberal, they they th they're thinking of I don't know if if that's what they're thinking, and this is this is what's interesting about the bastardization of of language and this whole Orwellian newspeak uh, that we see with this stuff. Yeah, Ravisades with a two dollars super chat saying Trudeau believes in totalitarianism, and I would agree with that absolutely because I mean that's what he's showing. He shows. I mean, I I'll always say this. Don't don't um, don't judge people based on what they say. Judge people based on what they do. And and what he's been doing is completely illiberal. And that, this is what the sentiment of Pierre Polyev was in this uh, in this comment. He's saying that no, they're they're not. There's nothing liberal about the liberals anymore. And um, yeah, they want to wear that name. I mean. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's 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 outrageous. It's it's the same thing a lot of times, even with conservatives when they when they talk about free markets and and whatnot, and you you know free trade agreements, uh, this kind of thing. I mean, even even under Stephen Harper, uh, you know, he he was very much he claimed to be a, a free market guy, but you know he was he was working on deals like the the Trans Pacific Partnership, which is very uh, n not free trade. It wasn't free trade at all. It's managed trade. Um, you know, my libertarian sensibilities, uh, would go, they go, they, my spidey senses, let's just call it go, go crazy. When I hear, uh, things like that, Steve's Hydra, the $5 super chat, Alex has been right more times than any politician in my lifetime. Crazy as he sounds sometimes. Yeah. With his, his nutty, uh, things and the and the way he even says them it comes across really crazy. But no, he has been right. He has been right a bunch. And here's the thing: I've had a lot of people saying to me, because um, you, you get these rumblings on on Twitter a lot, and I get the I get a lot of uh, reply guys in in a lot of my tweets. When I'm not talking about this in particular, but they'll they'll come in and they'll say, you know. Um, it's it's the mono party, it's the uniparty. There's no difference between Pierre Polyev and uh, Justin Trudeau. Um, I I I beg to differ on that. I beg to differ. Um, I, I couldn't disagree more. Actually, if you look if you look back, in, you know, before Trudeau was prime minister, he was still spouting a lot of this stupid ideology stuff. Uh, uh, he was really into this ideological, like leftist ideology, uh, ideological stuff. Um, you know, we just if we all just share, every, the world will be better. You know, uh, uh, an identitarian crap. He's always been into that. He's always spouted it. Uh, Pierre Polyev, on the contrary, has always been talking about fiscal policy. He's always been talking about economics. He's always been talking about how this is the more important thing to be talking about. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would I would love for somebody to show me similarities between the two of them going back uh, decades uh, th that a lot of people are espousing that I just don't I don't buy it. I just don't believe that it exists. I and that doesn't that doesn't mean that Pierre Polyev is going to be the savior of everybody. It's just um, 
it's a much better direction let's just say it is a much better direction and so alex jones pointing this out but what what's crazier than alex jones pointing out that pierre polyev seems to be a, a good candidate for the prime minister of canada uh, is the reaction? <laughs> it's more the reaction that that's uh, that brings that it, the hilarity ensues. So here we have we have um, uh, Cantin Nantel. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, really good uh, guy on Twitter or on X. He says Alex Jones endorses Pierre Polyev. Liberal and government funded legacy media meltdown coming in three, two, and of course, of course, what happens? The the Liberal Party. They run this, uh, this is an ad. Pierre Polyev just got the endorsement of far-right American conspiracy theorist Alex Jones. And here's Everything the clip. Got. They're going to pull out all the stops. We've got uh, the new Canadian leader set to beat Trudeau, uh, who's totally anti-New World Order. I mean, you look all over the world. We are rising right now. But that concerns me because the deep state globalists are going to throw out everything they've got. They're going to pull out all the stops. We've got uh, the new Canadian leader set to beat Trudeau, uh, who's totally anti-New World Order. I, I don't I don't know what's false about that. I, I'm not sure what's false about that. But, of course, the liberals are jumping on that one as a talking point. And we'll see we'll see where that goes. Rev Sadie's with a $5 super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, if you want to see a beautiful example of the Uniparty, look at the older rom-com called Moon Over... Uh, parader okay i'll have to uh, i'll have to check that out but yeah i'm not saying that there isn't elements of uniparty i'm 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 just saying that uh i i don't i don't agree with the the concept that uh, pierre polyev is uh is the same as justin trudeau which i hear a lot of sentiment of i hear a lot of people saying that i, I just i can't agree with that uh, scott gallant with a two dollar super chat the libs lost me at the budget will balance itself. Yeah, years ago, years ago. There's no way. Alex Jones is a great storyteller. Is is great at storytelling, though. Yeah, he, he's uh, he's a surrogate uh, Newfoundlander. <laughs> I don't know why Newfies have the best stories. They, they, you talk to a Newfie about you know just going to the store, uh, mundane story. It turns into something fantastic. Uh, I don't know what it is about new fees, but they, they just always seem to tell stories in in an amazing fashion. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's move on. So um, Glenda M putting this one out there uh, on on X saying, while the left loses, uh, while the left lo lost their ever loving minds over Alex Jones showing approval for Pierre Polyev, I just wanted to remind them who not only approves of but owns justin trudeau and here's uh of course uh uh the man himself uh who largely believes that he's penetrated the cabinets uh all all of this stuff wow my computer is super laggy right now i'm, I'm just gonna get on with a lot of this <laughs> get these things off my screen i hope it's not buffering too much on the other end let me know if it's bad um who didn't wake up to alex jones yeah well, yeah a lot of people uh at different times uh, konnichiwa konnichiwa uh out there let's get back to this screen Th that's helpful i think it it'll cut back a bit of the lag it's uh wow there we go i think i think we're on we're in time now uh but yeah alex uh, <laughs> you know it's it's bad when when there's conspiracy theorists, uh, you know, uh, endorsing uh, <laughs> Pierre Polyev. But but literally, what about what about the the conspiracies that actually exist? I don't have it at my my disposal right now. There's a, a photo floating around of um, Klaus Schwab while he's in an interview behind him in his own office. In his own office, he has a bust of Vladimir Lenin, like. The, the, these are the people we're talking about. Like, you you got to be absolutely kidding me, absolutely kidding, kidding me. But this is the reality of the situation. Now, we have uh, Andrew Lawton going on Twitter saying, um, "We do not follow the individual you mention or listen to what he says." A spokesperson for Pierre Polyev told True North News. 
<laughs> uh, of course, of course, deny, deny. This is the name of the, the the name of the game in politics. But who cares? Alex Jones has no no skin in the game in Canadian politics. He was just giving his two cents at the end of the day. That's all that was. But psh, what do you what do you what are you gonna say? What are you gonna say uh, to these the people who are really losing their mind? Who are the people that are really losing their mind? And using tactics like guilt by association, all of that stuff. Well, it's it's the political left. It's it really is. It's crazy. It's crazy. I don't even know what to call them because I I like again the whole left right crap. Whatever. I know people that are left of center, and I I get along with them just fine. Um, those people. I mean, the the political left today would consider them far right, extreme right. It's it's really crazy. Uh, Clyde is doing something. Yeah, yeah, apparently right now. <laughs> Oops, Clyde did something. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Uh, let's get on to it. This was an embarrassing scene. So this was, uh, this hour has 22 minutes trying, of course, trying to do a hit piece. It's it's funny because they kind of, they kind of sully their own image in them trying to sully uh, Pierre Polyev's image. And I mean, let's just, let's just go over this here. Polyev loves free speech. You can tell by the way he hates talking to the press and hasn't responded to any of our requests for an interview. Maybe okay, so he does talk to the press <laughs> often. <laughs> like, often he talks to the press and he's often attacked by the press. And which which is interesting because, you know, he's, he's kind of held up by the political right in Canada right now for being the only guy to actually have the backbone and, and talk back to the press. So, you know, when you hear a statement like that, you, again, this is this is John Stewart esque uh, media. And the, the, what, what is what is he trying to do? He's trying to hold hold a, a, accountable other people while not holding himself accountable. And then having this like we just tell fart jokes, you know, like that that sort of thing. Well, and you don't tell fart jokes about the other side. You know, you don't really go after we we all kind of know uh, the way things go there, but let's uh, let's see what he has to say in this one. Maybe he just doesn't check his email, but he did reach out to me personally with a very thoughtful robocall. I'm common sense conservative leader Pierre Polyev calling to give you a special invitation to my Spike the Hike, Axe the Tax rally at 1 p.m. Sunday, March 17th in Halifax. And the next Prime Minister of Canada, Pierre Polyev. St. Patrick's Day, Halifax! Now, huge cringe warning for everyone just right now. This is about to get really cringy. It's about to get really, really cringy. Um, because what, what, he, what he ends up trying to do is put Pierre on the spot, and it, and it backfires. It kind of it blows up in his face right here. I can uh, resist everything except temptation. I tried to get Pierre to notice me by playing it cool. <laughs> But I did have to stand in line with my fellow patriots. Wow, Pierre Polyev, such an honor to... Right, so it, the premise of his show here is that Pierre Polyev will never talk to him. Um, yet he stands in line and he gets an opportunity to talk to him. <laughs> I just, I, where, where are you going with this, you might ask? Well, let's see. Let's see what he, uh, he says. Stream keeps dropping. Apologies. Apologies uh, for that. I wonder if I can... Maybe I can set some of the things... Well, we'll watch this and then and then I'll get into some of the other stuff. Axe attacks rally at Devonshire Mall in what in Windsor, Ontario? Interesting. Let's say I get into it. My name is Dan. I'm with 22 Minutes. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you. Canada's next prime minister and laser eye surgery success story. Thank you. Congratulations. Right. I think you're doing an amazing job. Great. If it was up to me, you'd be the leader of the opposition for the rest of your life. Well, I won't be, sadly, for you and, and, and you and your, and your, but you know what? Uh, you'll have to earn a living rather than getting it from uh, taxpayers' money. I love that you're cracking down on crime. All right. I love that you're cracking down on murderers, thieves, CBC journalists. I love that you're cracking down on axing the tax while you're rate Okay, he's just overstaying his welcome. It's one of those. Maybe lower your bit rate, upload resolution. I've uh, had to close and reopen the stream a few times now. Let me let me go have a look at that and see what I can do here. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can change my bit rate uh, on the fly. 
Uh, I don't know if that's uh, something that's possible. Um, welcome home, Clyde. <laughs> I'm not. I'm in Japan still. I'm still over here in Japan. I'm getting. Uh, I'm getting message home. Awesome. Uh, okay, so I, I've gone away from sharing the web browser. Is everything kind of coming back? Uh, let me know. Let me know. It seems it seems more of like a power usage on my computer and less the less of an internet thing. So I think it's YouTube dropping Clyde, not Clyde's fault. No, it might be my computer. It might be you know I, I only have so much RAM on this uh, computer. So if I have a whole bunch of tabs open on this thing, to uh, you're cutting out a lot. Okay, it's better now. When are you home? Okay, good question. When am I home? Uh, I'll be coming back on the 15th of April. So what is it now? It's the 6th? So yeah, just, just under 10 days I'll be coming back. It's internet, less laggy. Okay, 20, 22 minutes in one hour is still too much. <laughs> what we'll have to do is uh, I'm just going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to uh, cut out a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about on, on the web browser. So let me just uh, close a bunch of these. Um, yeah, unfortunate. Yeah, it's, it is quite unfortunate for that. So let's uh, close a bunch of these browser windows. There's still a few I want to show you, but if I can close a pile of them, it might uh, bring the RAM to a, a manageable amount so that we could get through this stream uh, with less uh, less lagginess. Hopefully. Uh, they used to pretend to be impartial, but they fired that Sean guy from be for, for being too edgy, apparently. So what, was there a guy um, that was better? <laughs> That was better for for the whole thing, uh, I'd imagine. Yeah, if uh, if they have someone who's somewhat agreeable to, um, you know, and, and I'm not even saying right of center, like just centrist. It's crazy. Like you're just not allowed to be even a fence sitter if you work for any of these uh, any of these. Uh, companies uh government run companies it's unbelievable and yeah this is why people want rid of uh of uh the cbc at least like not rid of it like cbc should be be able to function and do its thing but the cbc should have to compete with everything else like go go ahead be you know do do the cbc just do it without 1.4 billion dollars of taxpayers money uh spawny 420 with 420 super chat of course uh uh what does that say uh deco deco gano uh 420 this yeah yeah it's for oh doko is that doko doko gano like it's it's 420 or 420 somewhere yeah it always is 420 somewhere thanks for the super chat my man appreciate that uh wait where was i where was i i was talking about um oh i flubbed on that holy cow wow brain fart um just thinking too much about the the stream here and, and the health of the stream uh what is everybody saying now is, is the stream coming through better now is it is it less glitchy uh, cause if that's the case, I'll just, I'll go through some of the stuff, uh, use phone and then I can, I can, uh, talk about <laughs> these stories that I'm uh, talking about defunding the CBC. That's right. Sorry for the brain fart. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> crash TV. So defunding the CBC isn't abolishing the CBC. The, the CBC should be able to function and do its thing and, and be able to get out there and compete with everybody else just as everybody else does. I have no problem with the CBC existing. I just have every problem with the CBC being funded by the government. I, I, especially with how lefty they've gone. They've, they've gone completely. Um, they favor one side politically, and that's fine. They should be able to do that, just not on our dime. 
that's it. That's all. That's all my my uh, my my request is, is that they stop getting my money to uh, try to propagandize uh, me, other people against my own interests. It's it's uh, taxation without representation right there. My, Mr. Roscoe Pico with five dollars uh, super chat. CBC will be on the road again. <laughs> Yeah, hit the road. Hit the road, Jack. And uh yeah, best of wishes. Like that's that's really my my opinion about the CBC. Best of wishes. I hope you do good. Uh but the problem is is they've be for one, with the giant budget they have, they've only become tabloid journalism. And so has all the all the other competitors who get ridiculous amount of subsidies funding directly from the government and what have they been doing with that with that money they've been just you know propagandizing people they they throw out you know we keep hearing this stuff about misinformation disinformation like how much how much miss and disinformation have we gotten out of the main i, I, I gotta cut, stop calling a mainstream media because they're not mainstream anymore. What is the mainstream? The mainstream today is the internet. People go to the internet to find their news, to find uh, opinion, to find any of this stuff. Now, you know, people might criticize what I do as just just opinion. Yeah, but same with uh, with any of these publications that have opinion pieces. I mean, that's what that is. That's always what that has been. And you know, Rex Murphy's no longer on the air, and he does his opinion online. He does it where where the people are. It's crazy. It's crazy, you know. Um, and I think I think others should should go out there and 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 have to do the same thing. I, I have no no qualms with with all these people coming in and competing in my space. I have no problem with that. Ravisades with two dollars super chat. Don't forget about the bonuses for the C suite. What what what? <laughs> I'm I'm not sure what the C suite. I'm I'm gonna have to. Is that something that came up recently? Uh, Clyde Mainstream Beer Lamau. You, you know what's funny? So we're working on a coffee brand, and I, I've been on vacation. I should have been working on it, but just I've been so busy with that. Uh, Gordon Hefferman with the two dollars super sticker. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, working on that, and hopefully we can do a soft launch uh, for the Discord people. If you're if you want to be involved in the soft launch, yeah, make sure you're over in the Discord. You get notified about that. But um, uh, we we were actually I, I was I was musing with the idea of having like some some sort of like like actually making wobbly pops like branded wobbly pops, but the regulation in Canada is just so uh, counterproductive. It's so counterproductive. The the this is what regulation does, right? When you when you when you put all this regulation in the marketplace, you're not you're not raising the bar. All you're doing is, um, you know, people will step up the ladder and then knock out the lower rungs, so nobody can compete. It's this is this is what regulation is. Um, like I've said this many times before, when you regulate a market, the first thing to be bought and sold is the regulator. That's that's the way it works. <laughs> and uh yeah if you if you if you think if you think you're you know it's for pr consumer protection consumer advocacy no it's always against the consumer it's it, it's you know it's prices will go up and you get a worse product and that's that's canada largely for for a lot of things and you know getting back to talking about pierre polyev and uh, you know is he going to do all the right things uh I think I think he'll do a lot of good things, uh, but there are a lot of other issues that I think he, he's just not even gonna he's not even gonna touch. Like, do you think do you think for one second that Pierre Polyev is gonna do anything about the dairy lobby? <laughs> if you want to talk about regulation in a marketplace, uh, the dairy lobby, we literally had Great Britain, our oldest trading partner, and one of our largest trading partners, walk away from the table from us months ago saying Canada you're not even serious because we held so much to the dairy lobby in our trade negotiations that was a deal breaker for our oldest and one of largest trading partners in our history as a nation they walked away from the table 
Like this, it's gone too far. It's gone too far. I mean, I'm in Japan right now, and we have coffee. We we have it with a bit of you know milk. I like a little bit of milk in my coffee. Um, you know, there's cheese. You get cheese snacks, things like that. I'll tell you what. Dairy products are so much better here. They're just they're they're better. And it's and it's not because of some em- embargoes or because of some uh, trade restriction stuff. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's in spite of it. Oh, <laughs> uh, what are you saying? Sakes, Clyde. Blank sakes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You want me to talk about earthquakes? I'll, I'll get into it. So I've been getting, I've been getting messages like crazy. Um, cause people are looking at the news going, Oh my goodness. Earthquake in Japan. Wagyu milk. <laughs> Wagyu, wagyu, like if you actually um, look at what the the meaning of the the kanji in that is, it just means Japanese beef. Gyu, uh, gyu is cow, and uh, wa wa is Japan. So wagyu. So like, um, for example, uh, shoku means cooking. Washoku is uh, Japanese cooking. So Japanese food. <laughs> it's, it's like that old joke what do they call Japanese food in Japan food but um, <laughs> let's get into this so I, I've been getting a lot of messages especially after um, the, the the earthquake that happened in, in uh, Taiwan there, there was an earthquake in Taiwan and it was it was big and it, it affected a lot of people and they didn't have a lot of the infrastructure that Japan has to protect them uh, themselves against earthquakes 7.2 I believe uh, magnitude on magnitude scale they don't use the richter scale anymore it says ma- magnitude so uh yeah that that happened and then immediately uh, social media went to okinawa japan is is uh, you know has a tsunami warning now uh there were warnings on the news here and yeah no i'm gonna get to that one oh, new york city had a 4.8 earthquake today oh what i didn't know that Japan is uh, extremely well built for earthquakes. Absolutely, it is. So, a uh, little bit of a backstory. A little bit of a backstory. Um, I was I was here in Japan. I was living here in 2011 when that big earthquake happened. Uh, a lot of people know about the the whole story with uh, Fukushima. Uh, and I don't know why that one dominates the headlines. Probably because nuclear and and uh, you can you can sensationalize that news. Why they weren't talking about you know the hundreds of thousands of people that were lost to the sea in Miyagi Prefecture? I think that's a bigger story. Uh, but they largely ignored that so that they could talk about um, nuclear meltdowns that didn't occur. This this is a in, the interesting thing. And and actually, so yesterday I was. <laughs> I know I'm kind of going all over the place, but it'll, it'll come. It'll come full circle here. Yesterday I was in a uh, space on Twitter. Uh, shout out to Wogpog if he's watching the show tonight. Um, Wogpog does a lot of uh, spaces on Twitter. Lots of really interesting conversations that take place uh, in the spaces. Uh, if you're not involved in in spaces, I'd recommend it. Go go over there, listen. Uh, uh, you can join in as a speaker. It's uh, a fantastic avenue a, a, a good venue for people um exchange exchanging of ideas and and it's it really is good uh we we got into this whole story yesterday when we were talking about this so it's really fresh in my memory um and w- w- what's interesting is w- what i do a lot on this channel is i i talk about how the media is they they jump to sensationalizing things and then they lie they lie about a lot of stuff and and then there's you know, there's different motive motives for them lying to people. And a lot of times, a lot of times it's, it's ratings. They just want to get ratings. Um, they're not doing it necessarily for nefarious, although that is kind of nefarious, but you know, what, what other people might think, uh, you know, some agenda or whatever. No, a lot of times it's, they just want the ratings. And, uh, you know, so today, today I, I actually have a platform for talking to people about this. But back in 2011, I didn't. I, I I wasn't doing a lot of this. I was doing my own thing. But I found myself in a situation where the news media was going 
absolutely bonkers over this uh, earthquake that happened here in Japan. Now, I was here in Tokyo for it. Now, in Tokyo, it was about a seven and a half magnitude uh, earthquake, and it lasted for a minute long. It was over a minute long. It was absolutely terrifying. Now, where where the big earthquake was at the time was in Miyagi Prefecture, and just off the coast, it was a nine magnitude earthquake. So almost topping the scale, almost topping the magnitude scale. It was really crazy. Black Pigeon lives in Japan. Yes, Black Pigeon lives in Japan. I like his channel. He's great. So uh, getting on with the story anyway, uh, as as um, as this th this earthquake happened and uh, the tsunami, we were waiting for the tsunami, and I watched as the news media relentlessly made stuff up. They just completely made stuff up. We were here as it was happening. And uh, and just just because like I've always known always, if if you want information, go to the source. Go to the source where where you you know you're gonna get the information from. And I had I had family contacting me and saying, you know, it's a nuclear disaster, it's all this stuff, all these things that are happening. Meanwhile, um, the news media was quoting the IAEA, the IA, the Atomic Energy, uh, you know, World Atomic Energy website. These are the guys that that regulate the atomic energy industry, and it's international. It's not run by government, I don't believe. It's it's independent, and it's uh, they they have no no reason to lie about anything essentially. And this is this is where they were. So. I'm following the website. They had uh, inspectors that were going to these. They go to these facilities very frequently. There's, there's no, there's no getting away from inspections in uh, the nuclear industry. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I'm paying attention to what the regulate, the, you know, these regulatory bodies are talking about it, and then I'm also watching the news media and what they're saying as quotes of the the uh this regulatory body now in the situation in fukushima when that earthquake happened and th at the time there was uh iaea io <laughs> is a un mob okay so yeah hoaxers are gonna hoax and this is the thing so the amount of information that was going out that was just ridiculous uh they had a they had a map of the the pacific ocean and it, it had like uh, waves, you know, it had these like uh, red zones and all of this stuff. And they were they were they were telling people that this was the radiation that was coming off of the out of the plant and going into the oceans. It was a tidal chart. It was a tidal chart. And they 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 cropped out the legend and then put in a new legend saying that this is radiation. And really, really was this egregious. It was crazy. The the amount of not not misinformation disinformation that the, the news media was putting out and this was all over the place it was rampant and and people were believing it and it was really crazy and yeah it's fear fear porn it really is that and so i was i was looking at it and i was you know you, we heard about an explosion we heard about all these things so i looked into it and yeah there was um there was an explosion due to hydrogen gas buildup because of the loss of coolant uh scenario that occurred um, then the IAEA was reporting that uh, some of the the aluminum casings were showing signs of a little bit of mel melting, and the news media took that quote and they they put headlines meltdown in Fukushima. Now a meltdown is 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 a specific scenario where the the fissile core melts down and goes into like the water table, melts down into the earth. Crazy different story from what was really happening at the time. So. It's amazing that, you know, I was trying to give this information to all my friends and family and stuff like that from here telling me Godzilla. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to inform people on this, but uh, no, it was the media. You know, who are you, Clyde? You, you don't know. This is the I'm, We're listening to the media and, you know, CNN and all these, you know, media conglomerates that just want you to keep tuning in and they figured it out they figured out this this concept that if you're 
if you're freaked out about a thing, you're going to you're going to come back and you're going to tune in later that day. You're going to keep looking. If there was a meltdown here, uh, wouldn't be much Japan left. Yeah, there wouldn't be. Or or at least it would, you know, it would get into the water table, stuff like that. Now, there was some irradiated water that, that leaked out into the ocean at, at the time of the event. But the thing is that the half-life of that was 10 minutes. <laughs> you know what I mean? 10-minute half-life. And, uh, you know, it's... It's uh, it's still today. Still today, they're they're freaking out about it. Uh, Vovin with a five dollars super chat. Uh, did you see the news article about BC having net loss migration? Sorry, I gotta scroll this up. Uh, for the first time ever, by eight thousand people last quarter. No, I didn't see that. Would you send that to me, or I'll have to look that up. Uh, send it over to me. Tag me on Twitter. Uh, post that on there. Chernobyl was worse. <laughs> yeah, Chernobyl was worse. <laughs> Chernobyl was a runaway reaction. Uh, Chernobyl was a was a, was a graphite um, a graphite core, right? So the technology was different, and in a loss of coolant scenario, in that you get a runaway reaction. The catalyst uh, concentrates rather than uh, is removed in that kind of a reactor core. So yeah, Chernobyl it, it became a runaway reaction, turned into a meltdown. Uh, bad news, really, really bad news. Not even close to what happened in Fukushima, but of course, media blows it up, and then Japan's government does the thing that Japan's government always does. They just they overemphasize safety, so they just shut down an entire area, and you know, move people out, recompensated them for their their you know their losses and all that stuff, and then left it left it sitting there. I mean, that's that's what they do. They they'll they'll go overboard. <laughs> they will, and then of course that breeds what conspiracy theories. You get all kinds of stuff. You you yeah, it melted. Yeah, well Chernobyl did. That's for sure. It melted down. Um, old video footage, nuclear hoax. Uh, yeah, bad design and reactor. Uh, yeah, well, the, the, the graphite graphite catalyst reactors are really bad design. They're banned now. They were banned after Chernobyl. They, they, like, they're gone. They're all gone. There, there are none of them. Imagine uh, CAA looking like yen in the 1990s. Uh, Vovin with two-hour super chat. It was a Canadian press article, April 2nd. Well, hopefully I can hopefully I can find it. Yeah, I'll look that up. That's uh, I'm I'm interested in that. Clyde is friend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Is the stream going okay now? Like, let me know uh, if uh, in the chat here if the stream is uh, is going smoothly or not. Because uh, it was not for a minute there, and it would be uh, it would be good to know if things are running smoothly or not. But yeah, I've, I've been getting a lot of messages from a lot of concerned people and I, and I understand people's concern, you know, and I, I appreciate that. I think that I, I thank, thank you all for, you know, being concerned of, uh, my safety and my, my family's safety. Yes. Much better now. Yes. Okay. So the problem's all with me using another browser and trying to show you guys, uh, stories here and videos. Clyde Brew something that's coming very soon. It's coming very soon. Make sure you're in the Discord if you want to get uh, ahead of the curve on that one. We don't want to do a product launch uh, um, right like with the with the whole community at first in case there's any issues with the uh, the fulfillment of it. And uh, <laughs> just we really don't want to uh, well, be causing a lot of trouble uh, to Red Raccoon Coffee. That that's for sure. But it's it's going to be good because it's going to be local Canadian coffee. It's not going to be uh, just some dropship company. You're going to be supporting uh, a local family man uh, in in this endeavor, and uh, and that's really what it is for me. Uh, supporting other other people. I I love that. I love that concept. Um, yeah, it's much better. Okay, good. It's good. Um, I I don't know what I'm going to do. I if if 
if we're going to be moving around a bunch in the next uh, given while, uh, I may have to uh, upgrade my laptop because this is just not going to cut it. Not going to cut it if um, if uh, it, <laughs> it can't if it can't uh, hold its own. Uh, you need to Discord title. Wait, what? Need you Discord title to find you, Clyde. Uh, it should be in the link in the description. If it's not in the link of this description, uh, this live stream, it'll be in the link to any other video. Uh, the Discord server is in the, yeah, the, just scroll down, go to the description. It's in there, and then you can join the community, and that would be good. Uh, Japanese couples starting to have children again. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I mean, the population is in decline at the moment. In fact, uh, there's an article that Wogpog sent me today. I won't be pulling it up on my web, brow web browser because it, it'll destroy the stream, uh, evidently. That's uh, what we're going through here. <laughs> but I'm buffering, but it's on my end. Uh, boo. Sorry to hear that. Uh, precious metal. Uh, anyway, let's get into it. So, um, and this is sad to hear. Um, this is from Zero Hedge, uh, written by Ty Tyler Durden, of course. I, I love that. Uh, but it, it appears that uh, Japan appears to be transitioning from homogenous society to embrace diversity and inclusivity by ushering in an era of mass foreign immigration, which uh, w will change the, the face of this country forever. A lot of the things that people love about Japan is uh, that it's Japanese. And um, there's, there's a lot of concern about that. Now, Japan historically has, you know, th there's always been immigration to Japan. It hasn't been, like, cut off completely. But they've always had a very strict, um, a strict, immigration set of rules and it's always been you, know, you got to be bringing something to the table that kind of thing but uh what web browser are you sharing out oh, it's chrome it might be it might be the fact that i'm using chrome that's so terrible i might have to uh switch browsers to something lighter maybe uh maybe start using brave or something like that and just turn all the stuff down it could be could be a way to fix it uh, Japan is awesome. Steve's hide <laughs> absolutely is awesome, but this this is this is what's concerning to me, and this this is coming from this article here. Uh, it's said to be a massive change uh, for a country that was still up until recently ninety seven point five ethnically Japanese, according to the CIA World Factbook. A Bloomberg report details how rapidly declining native birth rates. An aging society and chronic labor shortage is fueling an importation of millions of foreigners who are changing the face of Japan. The number of foreign workers in Japan has now exceeded 2 million, which, I mean, on the grand scheme of things, like if you look at Canada, you're like, oh, two, two, they have 2 million, <laughs> 2 million foreigners? Uh, apparently, we took in... 2 million in just like a couple of years in Canada. And we're talking like drastically different population sizes. I mean, I think Japan is 100 and 130 million people on, on, in Japan. Uh, Canada has now 41 million people now. Thanks. 30, it was only 38 million. It was 38 million only a couple of years ago. That's how crazy Canada's immigration has been going up. Uh, a 12.4% increase since on 2022. The East Asian country needs at least 647,000 working age immigrants per year to meet its 11 million worker shortage by 2040. Now, there, there are two schools of thought in Japan, and I know, I know this to be the fact. We'll, we'll see where they actually go with this. The article is talking about, about them going in the direction of mass immigration. But there are two schools of thought here in Japan, and that is um, uh, reduce, reduce a lot of things. Reduce expectations. Reduce um, uh, social security is one of them. 
uh, and and they have been working towards that. Now in Canada, in Canada, the Conservatives they they raise the vote. Uh, sorry, they raise the uh, the age of retirement to 67, I believe it was, uh, when they were in under Stephen Harper. Justin Trudeau gets in and he quickly drops it back down to 65. Uh, in Japan, what they did was they they had a different scheme, and people people were able to begin their retirements. But what they did was they said. Um, you're not going to be able to fully retire, unfortunately, because they just don't have, they don't have the income stream coming in from the younger generation. This pyramid scheme is is over essentially, you know, and and it, rather than just cutting people off, they were like weaning people off, and they're saying, you're not going to be able to fully retire. What we're going to do is we're going to get you to half retire. You go into semi-retirement, so people go down to part-time working. Uh, <laughs> Glad just wa finished watching ten hours of Kurosawa movies. No, no, but uh, <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, but th this is this is one of the ideas that they've had. Now, this is being pragmatic, right? The liberal government in Canada is just you're you're ridiculous. I mean, but a lot of liberal democracies in the world are ridiculous. I mean, they raise the they wanted to raise the the retirement age by one year in France, and they had riots in the street. It's like, what do you think is going to happen when the money runs out? Really? What do you think is going to happen when the money's all gone? Instead of retirement age raising, it'll just be gone. There will be no retirement. Like, people just really need to get this through their heads. Like, that... <laughs> I, just, I can't stress that one enough. He dropped it back to 65 because he knew he was going to kill the difference. That's it. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. Oh, I'm going to make everyone feel good, but you'll be broke. And we won't, you know, we're just going <laughs> to, we'll give you your retirement in, in devalued currency. It's, it's ridiculous. It's irresponsible and it's dubious at best. It's dubious at best. But yeah, this is, this is what happened in France. It happened in Canada. Um, that's crazy. Uh, that's why uh, they were rioting in France. Come on, Claude. That's not why they were rioting in France. Tell me why they were rioting in France. That that was the catalyst for those riots. Now, there's a lot of other issues, but that was the catalyst. That was the, the straw on the camel's back. 65 and made or die on the job. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's the other unfortunate thing. But... So, so in Japan, what they've done is they have semi-retirement. So people semi-retire. That'll last a few years, and then you can fully retire. And that's that's one of the things that they're they were trying to. Uh, these are some of the reforms that they've that they've jumped into. Ravis Sadie's with a five dollars super chat. Oh, your retirement age? Here, let me introduce you to Maid. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's in, that's 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 astonishing too because. Of just how straight for straight up they are about that the the whole idea of made being this um this thing that's going to revolutionize uh, healthcare savings that is just disgusting that is just disgusting that 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 that's something that was even comp contemplated um by by the government of Canada but that's that's where we are. That's like we're in demolition man territory. It's crazy. It really is crazy. Um, what even is a yellow jacket? Oh, this is the yellow jacket movement. There's been a bunch of these movements uh, either in in um, in Europe. Uh, there's the yellow jacket uh, thing that happened in in France, and yeah, it was largely cost of living stuff that um, that that sparked a lot of that, and then. Uh, Brexit, um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, regulation without representation stuff that happened there. Um, Occupy movement, yeah, there you go. The Occupy movement it was largely, uh, I, I remember that stuff when that when that started uh, sparking off. I, I was watching, uh, there's this left-wing publication called uh, Ad Block. Is it Ad Blockers? No, not Ad... Um, What's the name of that magazine? Somebody in the chat, if you know it, it's um, Ad Busters, I think it's called. 
and and they largely promoted that that occupy wall street thing and it was you know it was after yeah yellow vests in france but yellow vests in france were long before the riots that happened uh um recently but yeah adbusters adbusters was a lot, <laughs> was really behind a lot of the uh the stuff that happened in new york with the the occupy uh Tim Poole covered a, a lot of that. He was he was on the ground. He was he was there covering it. And it's come on, Clyde. The budget will balance itself. <laughs> you can get the Disney Channel and eat cereal. No worries. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, isn't Occupy Wall Street the Tim Pool claim to fame? Okay, so Tim Pool Tim Pool uh, was reporting on that. Now Tim Pool was doing a lot of other stuff at the time. Uh Love those ad busters. Well, yeah, <laughs> love love them, hate them. Uh, they're they were a formidable uh, force, I suppose. Big uh, big lefty publication. But uh, yeah, Tim Tim Pool was working for I believe he was. I I don't know if he worked for them or he was just doing contracting with them. Um, but Vice back when Vice was Vice. You know, before it became just some, uh, you know, lefty shill thing. When they actually did reporting, I remember. I remember when Vice was good too. They would they would go and just do interesting stories, a lot of Gonzo type journalism stuff. It was really cool. It was really cool. And then and then they became ideologically driven, and and you know, like everything else, that just becomes a massive failure. It was awful. So. Yeah, that's that's a thing. Vice, Vice magazine, uh, and and Vice, uh, you know, production and stuff like that. So, yeah, didn't Gavin McGinnis start Vice? Yeah, he did, and he got pushed out. He got pushed out by the other guys. Gavin McGinnis, interesting, interesting individual. Uh, Canadian started Vice. I forgot this. I forgot his name. Uh, well, Gavin McGinnis. Yeah, and and there's a few others. Uh, they were out of Montreal, and they were like all all in the punk rock scene. But uh, yeah, the Occupy movement in Scotland prior to the Yellow Vest riots in France a few years ago. There's yeah, there's a lot of these movements, and they 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 come and go, and um, you'll see a lot of the similar characters in in them. It's, it's becoming quite an interesting thing to observe. Steve's hide with a five dollar super chat. Occupy. Uh, scared our masters so they had to come up with a way to get us mad at each other just my opinion that i heard from jimmy Dore. lol i like jimmy Dore. he's uh he's an interesting guy um the, the reason why I, I i find him interesting is i i didn't like him before i thought he was he was a demagogue um when he worked for the young turks he he, he yeah he was incidentally he's he spit in uh, Alex Jones's face at some event. It was pretty bad. He since apologized for it, um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of these characters. It's really interesting uh, the development of of a lot of um, what's been going on. So Jimmy Dore used to work for the Young Turks. Uh, Young Turks, of course. Um, um, uh, what, what would they call themselves? A progressive uh, ideological organization. Um, and and they're going through some some interesting things at the moment. Now they were funded largely uh, from huge donors uh, on on the left to to keep going with their thing. Jimmy Dore he had a falling out with them. He had a fall, falling out with them, and then he became this. You know, Jimmy Dore is now a conservative former liberal. <laughs> he's not a conservative. He's not. He isn't. Uh, listen to what he's talking about. He still he still believes in a lot of like lefty ideology stuff, and you know I don't fault him for it. Uh, I don't agree with him on a lot of it, um, but at least when he advocates for um, at least when he advocates for uh, you know lefty stuff like he he he'll talk he'll talk a lot about um, what is it uh, co-ops. And things like that, like co-ops are the way to go. 
companies should, you know, we should get rid of companies and have the workers co-op and blah, blah, blah. Not necessarily like state run and state owned, not like full commie, but, but very much, um, like hopeful ideology that you'll get from like a lot of union guys when they're idealistic and they don't realize uh, what ends up happening with unions and how they just end up becoming the, the villains that they're you know fighting against. It, it really is an interesting thing. I'd love to, I would absolutely love to talk to Jimmy Dore about this stuff because I, I would like, I would come to it from a practical side. I'm, I'm not just, I'm not going to go at it with like some ideological bend, but like say, for example, here, here's my image of some of the stuff that Jimmy Dore advocates for. And like I said, I would love to talk to him about it because you know, I don't necessarily agree, but I, I do agree with his sentiment of like where he, his hopes and, and, and his, his, like the ends that he's trying to achieve. I just don't think that the, the means are how it's going to get there. Right. But at least he does it in a way that's more voluntaristic than like the state should run this stuff. You know what I mean? So for example, the idea of a, uh, a co-op, and I, I love getting into this stuff because this stuff really, uh, fascinates me. So you know picture picture taking a company and you, you break you break apart its uh, its uh, structure and you say okay well instead of somebody who owns the company owns the capital owns all that stuff it's actually owned by the lot of the workers so all the workers have uh, they have equity in in this firm and they all work for the goal to uh, to make money and to, you know, profit, blah, blah, blah. So, but they're, they're doing it in a market way, but they're doing it together as a group. This is the concept. This is what Jimmy Dore often advocates for. And, I, and I hope I'm not trying to, I really don't want to, uh, straw man his case. I, I'm trying to really steel man what he's arguing for. And, and a lot of people believe in this in this concept of you know the workers unite and then the workers own the means of the production. The workers do. The workers who are in that uh, factory or company, what what have you, right? I'm not talking about um, I'm not talking about you know the government owns it and yada yada. Okay, so we've established that fact. Now here's the problem with that whole concept. When when you own a business, you don't always get paid at the end of the week. It's not always how it works. You, sometimes you have to forego payment in order to invest in in uh, in capital things things like that. So you, you're you're at really asking a group of people to come together and and share not only the you know the fruit of their labor but also the losses, and that's a very difficult one. It's very difficult to get people on board with that, especially in group dynamics. So here's what would what I believe what would happen. And again, I'm not trying to straw man his arguments. I'm just I'm 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 trying to say that this this is how eventually it would revert back to ownership uh, in a few hands in a, in any any one of these situations. So you have a company; it's owned all by the workers, and everybody has an equal share of all of it. What what we, you would end up happening over time is people would, you know, be out of out of the expediency of their own situation and them wanting to get a payday now in the immediate. And perhaps the the business wants to, you know, invest in some capital, things like that, and they have to forego uh, getting paid. In, in the immediate, in the now, right? So what would happen there? So <laughs> you'd have a situation where some of the some of the workers would be like, you know what, like, I'd, I'd rather just get paid now. And then you'd have other workers that would say, hey, okay, here, how about this? Sell me your shares of the business. And then I'll just make sure that you get a paycheck every week. Or at least, you know, or the rest of us will will all you you know get these shares of the business and then you could just be an employee and you'll just get paid every week and you'll you'll no no longer have the responsibility of assuming losses or any of these other things this is really how things work people people go yeah okay i'm totally i'm totally into that you saying that i'll never have to worry about the losses i'll get my paycheck every week yeah there you go in no time and this is how it works. This is how it works. And in, in, in I believe it's a Pareto principle. I'm going to say that, you know, 80% of all the work done in any, you're being uh, betrayed. <laughs> uh, all of the work in 80% uh, of the work in any organization 
80% of the work in any organization is done by 20% of the people. Th this is just normal. And normally in, in that situation, if everybody's an owner, you know, people are going to be like, okay, you, you need to step up. You're going to have to pull your weight, things like that. These, these conversations are going to happen. In no time, the structure will change. The structure will change, and eventually you'll end up with 20% of the, the workforce owning 80% of the, of the capital. And then you'll have that 80% of people who, you know, just want their paycheck coming in and selling off their shares. And so it starts off egalitarian and then it just, it, these are, this is the natural function of it. I mean, you could disagree with that. I, this is, again, this is why I would love to have this conversation with people like Jimmy Dore who actually believe in this stuff. Cause I, I just don't think like if you ran this experiment, but this is the beauty of it, right? In, in a free market economy, you can run socialist experiments. You can do that as long as it's done on a voluntary basis. You can make it, make those these things happen. And if it works, then it works. Good for you. Uh, Vovin with a $5 super chat. You're describing literally literal communism. You don't get paid. You instead own what you produce by using the commons to produce it. You trade it. Well, that's not liberal, literal communism. Communism is uh, the means of the production owned by the state. And then the state will determine what you, what you get at the end of the day. Uh, there's no equity in anything. And because there's no equity, uh, people don't, don't push. Uh, they, they won't, they won't uh, invest further. They'll just do the bare minimum. And then because everyone else is doing the bare minimum, there's no incentive to do any more. So you'll just you'll do uh, the maximum amount or the minimum amount allowable, and then it, it that spirals down uh, until everyone's doing as little as possible. There's no uh, there's no innovation in that sort of uh, environment. Uh, Ravusades with a two dollars super chat: D uh, dividends to owners versus paid employee. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it it really it was it a ten ninety, so it's not actually eighty twenty, ten ninety. Uh, Japan censors the Chinese flag? I, I don't think they do. I don't think they do. Uh, guaranteed China love the WEF. Yeah, well, the WEF was based around uh, working with China in, in the beginning. That's why it was established in 71, right around the time of the economic reforms in China. I would love to uh, maybe do a whole show on that. Do a whole show on the history of that. Um, and when I say when I say real market economy, I'm talking about I'm talking about the idea that was this Clyde Clyde forming a brand brand Clyde. When I say market economy, like I'm I'm talking about the you know the state the state the the government has obligations in this. I'm I'm not an anarchist. Uh, I know there's there's a lot of people that believe in anarcho capitalism. I'm I I I I I love having these discussions with people, but no, I'm I'm not an anarchist. Uh, I I believe that the state does have a function, and I think that the biggest function of the state, in order to foster the best market economy, is to protect property rights. I think without the protection of property rights, uh, the there's creates a um, too much risk and then there's no economic activity if uh, if people can just steal what you have uh, people have a, a tendency not to not to um, um, do anything about that um, Vovin with five dollar super chat you're describing socialism completely different relation to capital there are no there is no state in communism uh, I'm talking definition by Marx and Lenin. Yeah, but <laughs> Marx and Lenin, Lenin, who wanted to bring about capitalism or communism and created one of the largest states uh, known to history. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's pie in the sky thinking uh, the whole concept of it's, it's the same same with anarcho capitalism um, unless unless you have an apparatus that will protect pro property rights 
you're not going to be able to have a functioning market. And there's a perfect example of this. I, I think it was written, I want to say it was written in Jeffrey Tucker's book, but I may have been from another book. Uh, Jeffrey Tucker's book, uh, 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 It's a Jetsons World. Great read, super easy read. I recommend it to everybody. But um, I think it was in his book. And he talked about, he talked about, I really hope it was in that book because it might have been in a different one. But there was a uh, sort of a parable of going to, I think it was Haiti, and they went to the marketplace. And it was, uh, the way it was written, it was talking about uh, a company that was doing a, a, sh a show about food. And, and they were there just to do this. But what was observed was really fascinating. And it, was, it had to do with the market economy. And w what they did was they went to this market in the morning to pick up food in order to do these like Caribbean dishes. And they went to the market and they had all these brilliant vendors, amazing vendors that were out there. And uh, they were selling all their goods. And by about midday or before midday, they all ran out of stuff. And, uh, and that was it. They all shut up shop. They did no more uh, vending. They did nothing for the rest of the day. And so some of these guys who were part of the team, they went and asked some of the vendors, why why would you only get enough stuff to last only like half the day? Why wouldn't you, you could keep the market open and you could go all day, you just get more stuff. And the the overwhelming consensus from all of these vendors was, no, we get enough so that we can eat and we can have enough for our families and, and live. If we get anything more, the war, local warlords will come in and just tax it all away. Like, whoa, okay, so this is new concept. They didn't, these, the, you know, the local gangs or warlords, whatever you want to call them, they didn't, they had no respect for property rights, but they knew, they knew this concept that if they were to tax away more than a subsistence level of living, then these people would revolt. And, you know, at that, at that right, they would lose their status as like, you know, the, you know, mob or, or gang of the region. And then a new mob would would come in and and say we'll be more lenient to the people. Uh, th this is this is literally how this works. So this is the problem. If if you if you have there's there's no yeah tax it all away. Yeah yeah seriously they'll just yeah anything above a subsistence level they'll just tax it. Oh you made too much give it pay over pay it up. And this is how a lot of the world works. And this is how a lot of the world has worked for centuries. It's This is how serfdom worked. You know, you'd have your daily grind and anything more, you'd have to give it up to the lords. Like this is this is the way the world has always worked. And it was, it was, you know, in different circumstances throughout the world where, you know, market economies were actually able to function because you didn't have these, these tyrants coming in and taking all your stuff. And, and that's when a market economy functions. Kidding. There's just, there, there is a point. There is a point uh, when you're taxed too much. And it's amazing to me, uh, especially with Canadians, is that so much of the taxation is done in, you know, sleazy, skeevy ways so that you don't even know what's happening that, you know, people would revolt in Canada if they knew how much of their money was was just getting ripped away from them by the government like we all know how much is you know how much we pay in taxes you know uh income taxes you know uh government you know federal and then provincial and then we have our CPP contributions your UI contributions all of these other things but then they add all these taxes that you don't even see which is crazy um interesting in British Columbia we had this thing at the the liquor stores were just they would just add the taxes at the uh, at the end of the thing, and you would just pay the the price that it showed. And the government came in and said, "No, you can't do that. You have to add the taxes afterwards." And then I laughed at that because how many taxes are you adding before you even get to that point? And then you add the sales tax on top of it. Why 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 uh, draw the line there? It's really crazy. Yeah, taxation without representation, like. Most people don't realize that the Boston Tea Party was based on, I think it was like a 2% tax on one commodity, one commodity tea. 
and it was it, there was no representation on that and they that was the catalyst that that fueled uh <laughs> the revolutionary war uh that separated the united states from uh the commonwealth unbelievable but yeah in canada of you know if people believe at the end of the day that their the fruits of their labor will be taken from them or that their capital can be even taken from them they are less likely to engage in the market at all that's that's it so yes this is this is the concept of regime uncertainty that the that the austrian school talks about as you know if the government comes in and you you don't know because they've they've been making measures of like you know confiscating wealth confiscating capital confiscate uh of of all kinds then you're going to see a massive exodus of of people's investments and we're watching this happen right now in canada and it's crazy thomas soul writes about this he writes about the whole concept of uh, there's there's so much that you can take away from people that um, in taxation that it actually becomes detrimental to uh, raising of of revenue. So uh, it's funny because over and over again, you, in the states you'll get Republicans to come in with tax cuts. In Canada you'll have uh, conservatives to come in with tax cuts. You look at the actual revenue raised when you cut taxes the revenue goes up it it, it sounds counterintuitive but it but it isn't actually at the end of the day in ontario 50 percent uh easy before gas property tax yeah 50 percent more than 50 percent of your the the fuel price is tax before we even pay the gst or any of that stuff on it it's crazy is anyone else getting an awful stream connection? Uh, yeah, apologies. Apologies for that. The stream is, uh, it is what it is. It's getting, I, I'm going on tangents too here. I, I need to, uh, I want to get into some of the things that I was going to talk about. Checking my, uh, yeah, lots of, uh, lots more worries of, of earthquakes hitting Japan. Uh, Japan gets nailed with earthquakes all the time. It's uh, it's just kind of a, a normal thing. People only pay attention to the earthquakes that are happening when when their friends are in Japan, uh, but they're they're all the time. Glitchy again. Oh no. How are Canadians to pay for all the newly hired bureaucrats? Um. Again, so I, yeah, like this this frustrates. This frustrates me a lot. And I'm sorry for all those people that are getting a glitchy stream. Uh, you'll be able to go back and watch it and without all the glitches, obviously. Uh, that's a thing. I really uh, really appreciate that. Yuji Tai with the $10 super chat. Thanks for thanks always for the kind words. Uh, please treat Ray and Ni <laughs> to something good. My kids, my kids. Thank you, Yuji Tai. Uh, of course, uh, UG is, uh, is my, my, uh, roaster. He's my, my coffee man. Uh, you can go check out red raccoon coffee, uh, Google that he's uh, right out of Vancouver and we're going to be working together to bring some, uh, some good coffee to, uh, to all of you out there. That's going to be good. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be taking the kids to the park right after this. Um, uh, that's what the carbon tax is for the bureaucrats. Now this is ah, this is where it's insane, um, because the revenue the revenue that they get and the cost that it costs everybody is so disproportionate. It's crazy. I'm I have to show you guys this video. I hope it doesn't glitch out the whole stream, but this is really this really illustrates the the whole thing right here. Let's let's get into this. Uh, ba 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 ba. Hopefully this doesn't glitch out the stream. One of the essential elements in C8. <laughs> it's glitchy. Glitchy right out of the gate. Is the historic underused housing tax act. This. Okay, my. 
internet is just sketchy at best right now. Can we make this work? Something went wrong. Reload. Retry. Here we go. NC8 is the historic underused housing tax act. This is an important step. It is an important step for affordability for Can nope. Canadians. We're not doing Let's good. Let's talk about the Liberal government's new underused housing tax. In 2021, the Liberal government said it would tax foreign owned homes 1% of their value. They claim that this would help with Canada's rising cost of housing and that the proceeds would make housing more affordable. The government <coughs> said it expected to raise almost $170 million in this new tax. It may have sounded like a good idea at the time, but I and other Conservatives were skeptical that this tax would be effective or efficient. The new tax has been roundly criticized for creating so much confusion <coughs> that citizens have had to hire accountants <coughs> just to help with the paperwork. What's worse, is that the government requires this paperwork to be filed every single year. But the results are now in. Since 2022, the government has spent <coughs> $59 million in administrative costs on the underusing housing tax alone, including hiring an additional 350 people. The CRA has assessed amounts owing to the government of just $49 million, but they haven't even started to collect that money yet. I've seen bad deals for taxpayers before, but this is just sad. The government's spending more at administration than it collects and imposing new compliance costs on taxpayers every single year. Because it's so complicated, farmers, small businesses, and everyday <laughs> Canadians are having Excuse to me. hire accountants to fill out the paperwork. Some are paying more than $1,000 a year. That means over this is where it gets ridiculous. million dollars of compliance costs annually. Five hundred so million dollars in annual compliance costs. Forty-nine million dollars in new taxes. Okay, I'm gonna pause it right there. Hopefully, the stream comes back. So you you bring in a new tax. This isn't even the carbon tax. This is one of these new uh, housing compliance tax things. Um, it costs taxpayers out there in the economy. It's going to cost people, you know, for just, you know, implementing it, having to do the paperwork around it, having to comply with it and pay uh, the taxes on it. Five hundred million dollars. This puts at a disadvantage to everybody out there. And all it collects is forty nine million dollars. Ten percent of the cost just to just to make it happen. This is ridiculous. At, at at what point does everything just give? You you just can't you just can't keep going down this rate. It, it's really crazy, and we're supposed to believe it will save us money. Lum Fao. yeah, that's right. Penny D with a twenty dollars super chat. I would love to see Jordan Peterson on your show. I would love to see Jordan Peterson on my show. Uh, on w one night when it's not as this glitchy, that would be uh, that would be amazing. Yeah, if he would ever uh, speak with me, that would be that would be fantastic. I would uh, absolutely love to speak with uh, with him. Well, he's a brilliant mind. But this this is this is just insane. How how is it that we're supposed to um, look at this and go, okay, that's that's fine. We'll just deal with that. We'll just totally deal with that. <laughs> no problem. And these these are all these uh, these things that the the government are trying to implement, bring into into Canada, and uh, and say that we're all benefiting from it. But <clears throat> again, this is this is the mo. This is the mo of uh, of the liberal government in Canada. It's wishful thinking. You know, I I get it. I get I get the of the wishful thinking part it's just the it's the pragma it's it's the lack of pragmatism it's the lack of thinking it out you know, step after step after step the motives the motives are in the right place for 
well, I don't know about Justin Trudeau, but you know, people on the left that, that believe this stuff, the motives, the motives are in the right place. But the question is, is it, is it going to, is it going to work? And, and that's really, that's really where it comes down to. And I, I think this is how we reach across the aisle and we, we start to convince people on the other side of the aisle. Again, like I was talking about, uh, Jimmy Dore, you know, I like, I like the guy, I disagree with him on a lot of things, but, but that's why I would like to speak with him. Cause I don't, I don't want to demonize people like that, that have different thoughts or different ideas of how the world works. I just, I want to, I want to follow through with the thoughts, you know? Oh, if, if only we could just make a system where people all share in the ownership of stuff. Okay. Well, let's thought experiment that out and we'll, we'll see how that pans out. Uh, how has that panned out in the, in the past when we've, when we've experimented with this stuff? A lot of times, like the more hard nosed socialists, they'll just say, well, you know, people voluntarily, you know, go away from it for this reason or another. So therefore we need to use force. Okay, now you're showing your cards if that's if that's what you believe. I'm not saying that that's what Jimmy Dore believes, but I think that a lot of us do believe that, that we need to use force to uh, force people to do one thing or another. And in the past, what happens when we use force? We've we've witnessed that. Uh, Jimmy Dore thinks that Canadian healthcare is the best in the world because it's free. I would invite Jimmy Dore to uh to move to canada and, and try that out absolutely <laughs> no it's it sucks it absolutely sucks in canada it's some of the worst um in the oecd we we rank dead last in healthcare, which is embarrassing to say the least maybe when, when you move to texas <laughs> maybe if I, if I end up moving into Texas. Yeah, Jimmy, I don't agree with him on everything either, but at least he's principled. They even call him right wing now. I know, I know they do. And that's what's funny. And I, I do think he's principled. And that's that's why I like I like to have these conversations with people. And, <clears throat> you know, I try my best to reach across the aisle, but I don't get a lot of people that want to come on the show from the other side. You know, I'll get a lot of people that will come on the show, you know, and a lot of times it's preaching to the choir. I would really like to get people from the other side. Um, Jimmy Dore is in Vancouver May 10th. That's cool. I didn't know that. Maybe I'll go see him. Maybe I'll even get a chance to meet him. Use the forest, Luke. <laughs> yeah. Uh, te Texas. Pff, I'm going to Mexico. <laughs> Good luck with that. Good luck with that. Uh, Jimmy Dore is hardly right wing. No, he's not right wing. I wouldn't say he's right wing at all. He's he, he's he he calls himself a progressive all the time. He, he's not shy about it. And but that's not to say that again, when it comes to Jimmy Dore and his his ideas, because I listen to him, and a lot of his ideas that he says. Maybe his healthcare ideas. If he if he thinks that Canada is a great healthcare, system, yeah, whatever. But uh, you know, when it, I've listened to him talk about co ops and all that stuff, and I'm not saying, uh, I'm not saying that he, well, I would say that he, I, I believe that he's wrong about it. But I, what I, what I would give him in you know with, with do do respect, right, is that he wishes to do that in a free and fair economy like he wants to bring about co-ops which is voluntary on on all levels and i think that that's uh that's commendable you know whether it'll work or not is you know only time will tell on that one um i i tend to incline <laughs> i i tend to uh think that it won't but that's neither here nor there i and this, this is why i would like to have these conversations with people, <clears throat> again, uh, I, I see Jimmy Dore like kind of on the center center left. I don't see him radical left, even though he calls himself a progressive. He's got, um, you know, 
he's he's not quite he's not uh he's not the young turks that's for sure and what's happening with anna kasparian apparently she's uh she's having some serious doubts about uh <laughs> leftism because leftism's going crazy right it's gone it's gone off the deep end and she had a rant recently where apparently like people were you know the crime's going way up and all this stuff and she says well if that's if that's the left i'm not the i'm not on the left you know oh okay Jimmy Dore is hilarious. Yeah, he is. I like Jimmy Dore. Um, we're in information bubbles. Depends on where you live. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I try to reach across. I try to reach across as much as I can uh, to people. And here's the thing. I think it's I think it's easier for me because, <clears throat> you know, I get I get labeled as a conservative. I get labeled as this or that. I'm I I'm I'm the worst conservative out there. Uh I'm I'm not really much of a conservative. I I'm more of a classical liberal or a libertarian. And that that's where I'm But I but I try to stay away from the especially away from the libertarian um uh title that one cuz there's a lot of wack wackos in that in that group. <clears throat> what time is there, Clyde? It is just after noon here in Tokyo. Anime next, Clyde. <laughs> you guys can all go find the anime channels. Uh, there's plenty of them out there. Clyde isn't conservative. He's a mechanic. <laughs> uh, it, these days, if you're not woke, you're far right. Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? At least that's their their perspective on that end. But this this is why guys like Jimmy Dore get considered far right. That's just ridiculous to me. Again, he's on the left. Uh, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's on the left, and he gets called far right. I mean, w w where would I sit on the left right uh, paradigm <clears throat> as someone who's a classical liberal? You know, like. My perspective is is much like, like I say, I, I keep saying this, you know, Thomas Paine. I'm a Thomas Paine liberal, if if anything. Um, yeah, Yuji Tai saying uh, Russell Brand. Russell Brand, he's very lefty. Uh, Tammy saying proudly in the far right. Ever heard of John Dobb? He does lives from Japan all the time. No, I haven't heard of, I haven't uh, heard of John Dobb. I'll have to look him up. <laughs> Nothing more honest than a knuckle buster. And you know, it's funny. I, uh, I I'm sure you guys know the channel AVE. Uh, I've done a few things with him over the years, uh, and he's a super cool guy. And he he always says he's like you know left right left wing right wing. They're all just feathers on the same bird, right? And it really is like, wh why would you pin yourself in one category or the other? Um, again, I, I agree with a lot of things that uh, a lot of people say that that claim themselves to be on the left, right? But then I disagree with other things. I I don't I don't think it's a, a matter of contention. And again, like I said, like guys like Jimmy Dore, uh, he's advocating for lefty things that that can happen on a voluntary basis in a free market economy so you know it's on from my perspective it's like a okay good on you try it out have fun you know um knock yourself out um it, it that that kind of thing doesn't affect other people it's when <clears throat> it's when the the lefties that want to change uh change the rules of the game which means i won't be able to do the things that i want to do in my life if if a group of people want to start a co-op that doesn't change my life go for it try it if it works good good for you <laughs> like I, that's really where i come from penetrated uh tardo is wef cork soaker <laughs> okay i like that i like that um yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm completely opposed to, uh, you know, one, identitarianism, uh, two, uh, totalitarianism or authoritarianism of any sort. 
And you'll 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 find that on both sides of the aisle, mind you. You will. And I'm 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 completely opposed to it. I don't I don't like the idea of um, identity politics, which I find abhorrent. Uh, and you'll see you'll see a lot of that. You'll see a lot of that on on both sides, um, you know, <laughs> and and I've even seen in recent times uh, identity politics uh, coming up on the right, and and I don't agree with it. I can't get on board with that stuff. No, thank you. You put your left foot in. You put your right wing out. <laughs> <laughs> do the hokey pokey yeah that's it that's it uh my my philosophy is uh have less government in my life the the better the less government and not just the less government less busybodies less busybodies less other people trying to tell me what i can and can't do you know obviously there's things that you know there's rules that, that need to apply to everybody but at the same time uh, you know, what's, what's the old, uh, <laughs> what's the old song by, uh, Hank Williams, uh, mind your own business. Cause if you're minding your own business, you won't be minding mine. It's one of those. And I'm, uh, I'm really all about that. <laughs> why are we, why are we saying, uh, food names in the chat now? Is it, is it already devolved to that? Uh, classical liberalism means you work the commons. Hold on, I gotta scroll that that one back so I can read it. Classical liberalism means you work the commons, you own what you produce, and there is a social contract, aka uh, raison d'etre of the state, uh, to maintain the commons and protect protection of liberty um yeah i don't know if i agree with the whole the commons thing so there's uh there's a problem with the commons and and it's it's actually um that's that's well established in, in economics is the, the problem with the commons being that you know if there's any ever any common areas um commons always get over consumed um I think the classic example is the Dust Bowl of the the 20s. So the idea behind that was that there was common area, common area where everybody was allowed to graze their cattle. And uh, so immediately what people do in that scenario is they, um, <laughs> and this is the, this was the social contract, right? You're, you're allowed to go graze the commons uh, so people wouldn't graze their own area with their cattle. They would just graze the commons, and then they would overgraze. They would end up overgrazing. Uh, because if if you didn't overgraze, well, your neighbor would overgraze. And it's it's all going to be gone, so you might as well get some before the before the getting's gone. And uh, that was that was a whole concept. Uh, that, I don't think that had anything to do with classical liberalism, uh, bringing about commons and, and saying that everybody has a, a, a right to uh, commons or any of that stuff. Cla classical liberalism was, was about the idea of property ownership um, and uh, your liberty around it. It's literally built around the commons. This is John Locke, John Stuart Mills, etc. cetera. Um, I'm gonna have to go back into the the academia of that because uh, yeah the the Dust Bowl was the dirty 30s. Well, it was brought about by the 20s, and the and the the problem with the commons there. I like Pierre's comment uh, of I just want to govern the government and leave the people alone. <laughs> Absolutely, that's the idea. That's the idea. And again, if you leave people alone, you'd be surprised the amazing things that they end up doing. Uh, can we have an impeachment of Justin Trudeau? So I don't think there's there's a mechanism for that in the Canadian uh, Parliament, uh, except except the vote of no confidence. But we're we're stuck in a gridlock at the moment. 
no we won't have a no confidence i i'm i have no confidence in uh the coalition that that we have in government right now i don't and that that was some crazy news that just came out recently on the same day on a what was it a thursday was it thursday or was it friday in canada when they announced this but they announced that they're uh that they're done they're not going to be they're not going to be running in the uh the next election they're finished one of them's riding is is just going to be eliminated through um through the the rezoning but that's the thing ravis sadie's with a ten dollar super chat uh there is a reason that the term tragedy of the commons is a thing a good example right now is looking at water contracts for the colorado river yeah it's an interesting one <clears throat> i don't know necessarily about the the water contracts with the colorado river um but i, I i'm gonna try to contact him when i get back to canada I've wanted to talk to him for some age, some amount, exorbitant amount of times. I've read a lot of his work and uh, I've listened to hundreds of hours of his lectures. Dr. Walter Block of the Mises Institute. Um, I would love to get in touch with him because even back in the day, he uh, he worked for the Fraser Institute in, in Vancouver uh, before moving to uh, Alabama, I think it is, where the Fraser Institute is. And... He's amazing, and he talks a lot about a lot of these uh, issues with the commons and, uh, and waterways and how, um, how property rights could resolve a lot of uh, water issues if, uh, yeah, Walter Block, he's fantastic. Um, he, talked, he talked about um, like free market environmentalism and how that would work. It was uh, really good. For, is the Fraser Institute Sean Fraser correlated? No, not at all. <laughs> no, no, no. The Fraser Institute's um, it's a free market think tank in Vancouver, uh, out of Vancouver, which is amazing. That it's that old that you know uh, came out of Vancouver. Uh, but yeah, no, Walter Block, he's had, a, he's had some really interesting concepts uh, talking about free market solutions to a lot of these um, uh, common issues and how if uh, property rights were respected, uh, we, could, we could get into a lot of these things. So incidentally, uh, it, was, it was a lot of uh, imminent domain laws that, that stopped um, environmental progress even even in the times of the robber barons, which is really interesting. So, uh, if you go back, if you go back to the days of what, what they call the robber barons, but they're um, you know trying to industrialize uh, North America and put train tracks across across the the whole continent. There was um, there there was these locomotives that would go by these farmer fields, and uh, the farmers would have to deal with the damages of the soot that would end up settling on their fields and because of this where there was these lawsuits that were that were occurring and and these uh railroad companies would have to pay out tremendous amounts of money and damages to these and this is this is when you know contracts were honored property rights were honored and because of this, because of this, the railroad companies were actually looking into and they were doing tons of R&D on their end to clean up their act, to actually uh, figure out a way to collect the soot and so it wouldn't go up into the air and it wouldn't come down onto these farmers' fields because they, were, they continually had to pay damages to these farmers just for having their train run past the property. And... Uh, and it, it was working out and and all of this uh, you know emi early early emissions devices were being developed uh then uh, the government came up with these ideas called uh you know eminent domain and the the for the greater good sort of laws it's it's better that we have these railways and we have these railroad companies um and yeah they might stomp on your rights a little bit but we're gonna have to just we're going to have to add that to the social contract and make that part of uh, one of the things you just have to deal with in being a, um, you know, post-industrial society. And, I, you know, th these were these were giant mistakes made. I think if you look at it from an environmental protection, <coughs> excuse me, 
<coughs> an environmental protection uh, standpoint, I think you you have a much better way of protecting environmental issues if you have a uh, stake in the property and uh, and you're able to defend it in civil courts. Uh, not I, you know a lot of these cases didn't go through the criminal courts, but they did go through the civil courts. And it actually we keep hearing this now, right? Price on pollution. We want to put a price on pollution. There is a price on pollution. Just repeal these eminent domain laws that that remove the actual price on pollution. And this is the kind of thing, <coughs> excuse me, that um, that could work out in this favor. And and I press one if you sign the con social contract. <laughs> yeah, none of us did. None of us did. Uh, but yeah, this, this is, uh, this is a lot of the, um, the things that come up in these conversations. I, I would really, really love to, uh, to have Dr. Walter Block on for a, a number of, a myriad of different reasons. Uh, but one in particular is to talk about free market solutions to environmental problems. And I, I think, I think if we actually just repealed some of these laws that, uh, allowed, uh, big, you know, big polluters to get away with the pollution that they do, especially in waterways and all these other things. Uh, I think, I think we we would have an actual uh, way of, uh, you know, staving off a lot of pollution. And I'm talking real pollution. I'm not talking about uh, carbon dioxide in the in the atmosphere. Uh, Clyde, do something. Are you back in Canada already? No, I'm in Japan right now. And this is why I'm working on a potato uh, setup. <laughs> this is why I'm talking to you guys with just the chat off to the side, this background that I have going on here and natural lighting that's coming in. Fart tax. Uh, yeah. All this stuff is just ridiculous. Gibo said, carbon taxes are supposed to modify our behavior. Yeah. So, I mean, what is it then? Uh, is it going to modify your behavior because it's going to cost you money? Or does it not cost you any money because you get a rebate? Like, think think that one through. Like, actually think that one through. Like, let's go through that whole logical process of that one. Okay. Canadians are going to get back more than they contribute to the carbon tax. But it's a behavioral tax. We're going to get you to stop buying fuel. Wait a second. What? So, which is it? Which is it? Am I, am I getting a paycheck from the government? Uh, Quick Dick McDick, he did a video on this just the other day, where some some, some wing wing nut on social media was 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 putting the same idea out there, and it's like, are you are you really that short sighted that you only think about the the money that you spend at the fuel pump on a carbon tax? That goes out to everybody that uses like you're only adding that one in you're only adding that one in okay so if you only consider the tax that you pay at the pump for fuel that you use for your car then then that's that's all all you're gonna think and then you get this rebate and it's more than you paid in carbon taxes okay so that's 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 as simple-minded as you are that's as simple-minded as Gibo is. It's as simple-minded as all these people are. Okay, well let's let's look at the grand scheme of things. The, the like, put it out there in in more context. Okay, so everybody down the road is paying a carbon tax. Every literally on the road, literally on the road. People are saying, well, farmers are exempt from this. Are you kidding me? They're exempt from marked fuel marked diesel that's it that doesn't exempt them from natural gas usage we live in canada do you think livestock are just you know cows and and sheeps and pigs they're just naturally uh, able to survive the frigid minus 40 winters in in saskatchewan and manitoba and alberta you you serious you you serious like are people serious on this line no and the 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 natural gas that people have to use to heat these heat these barns to keep these animals alive through the winter it all gets carbon taxed to a, a huge degree and do you think do you think the, the farmer's just like oh darn 
I gotta pay that carbon tax, but I'm, I'm still gonna sell my my uh, my animals for that same old price that I sold last year. No, the price goes up. It's gonna be a surcharge in the the in what it costs to make that product. So yeah, okay, right on that, right there, the cost of meat goes up. Okay, the cost of meat goes up. What else? What else goes up? The cost of manure goes up. The cost of all of these things goes up. Um, wh what else would, might a farmer need to use that's not just marked diesel? How about grain, drying grain? That's done with natural gas as well. Like there, there's all kinds of stuff. Oh, okay, how about all the stuff, you know, you, you want to buy farm equipment? <laughs> the manufacturer in Canada had to pay carbon taxes on all that stuff. It's baked in the price of a new piece of farm equipment. Like everything goes up. And then when the and then when your farmer's done paying all those carbon taxes to make that product, meat product, da uh, you know, dairy product, uh, grain product, whatever product, now it goes on a truck and it gets shipped to you. You serious? And then not only does it not only does it raise the price of of the of all these products in Canada, but it puts our our farmers at a disadvantage internationally because they can't sell their products on the international market against American producers, against British producers, against other producers around the world. It's crazy. It hurts us all. It hurts us all. Yeah. So, yeah, if you're paying the carbon taxes and the carbon tax gets put, yeah, holy cow. <laughs> exactly. It's crazy. Like, it, it's just, it's just a, you know, crap runs downhill idea here. It, it doesn't, it doesn't take a whole, you know, you don't have to be rocket scientist level thinking to make this work or just even to con conceive this notion, but it doesn't end at the stupid pump for your, for your sedan. It doesn't end there. It ends at the price of everything going up across the market. And then us not being competitive. How about how about those businesses were just making the margin, just making it, just making it. Carbon tax goes up by 28%, 23%. Got to fire somebody. I got got to let somebody go. Sorry, Jim. I know we loved having you for, you know, 20 years in the company, but we we're just making the margins and now we don't have enough for, you know, 10 employees. We got we can only have 9. Sorry, Jim. You know? Like this is what's not thought about, and th this is this is the whole thing, and I think liberal economics, and I'm I'm saying liberal loosely, like in the contemporary term, but liberal economics, it, they only go one step. It's like transactional. It's okay, we put a tax on a thing, and then that's it. It that's as far as it goes. That's we're not thinking about it anymore. Yeah, poor Jim, poor Jim, no job, no job anymore. But that, that's as far as it goes and when it comes to economics uh, for people on the, in the Liberal Party or, or even the, uh, the, uh, the NDP. Some of them are even worse. What was it? I, I don't want to pull up another clip and re ruin the stream again. But Jagmeet Singh um, was talking about this recently. He was talking about this... Uh, I saw a clip of it. It drove me wild. It drove me nuts. Maybe I can, maybe I can pull this up on my phone so I'm not destroying the stream. Uh, I it just, it's unbelievable the stuff that comes out of this guy's mouth. Like, just completely economically illiterate. Like, really. I thought I had the clip here. Oh, tell me it. I or did I just reply to it? <laughs> okay, here here's a, a tweet that I put out just the other day. So it might be hard to see here. Uh, but this is just this is me at the bar. I, I stopped by the bar to to grab uh, a a pint of beer and some fish and chips. And yeah, it's the cutest little um, fish and chips that you'll ever see. But, um, and I, I wrote this, it may be the cutest little order of fish and chips, but 
It is also a full pint of beer. Tell me where you can get this in Canada for the price of $12. $12. <clears throat> Unreal. So I got I to gotta find this clip. Where is the clip? Oh, and of course, the amazing Zoltan hits me up. This is the clip. So another disastrous interview for Jagmeet Singh, who uh, proposes an excess profit tax. Absolutely any sort of coherent definition of what constitutes an exact an excess profit now i'm gonna i'm just gonna play the audio off of my phone but this is this is a clip that uh amazing zoltan put out there so much for being here today. I really appreciate your time coming into the station. Of course, you're in Hamilton today for an announcement. I mean, why make this announcement in Hamilton? I wanted to make sure people in Hamilton felt like they were also receiving attention, that we are making sure that people know that we see them and hear them. And we know that one of the biggest concerns that people have here in Hamilton and across the country, cost of living, yeah. particularly the cost of groceries. On top of that, we want to go after the root cause. Yeah. And one of the major causes that's driving up the cost of food is corporate greed. We know that these large corporate grocery stores are making big, more profits than they've ever made before <laughs> while people are having the hardest time buying groceries. So we want to tackle that. Yeah, and you mentioned excess profits is sort of what you're tackling here. What exactly do you define as an excess profit? <laughs> yeah, so we what is looked it? at different ways of addressing excess profits because it is you know, interesting. How do you say, how do you determine what's an excess profit? Mm -hmm. Tell me. Well, we look at previous years and the average of what a company has made, factor in some growth, and what is well and above that we would consider excess profits. There are other countries that have done so. They've used different ways, different mechanisms of addressing it. But ultimately, we want to get at the fact that if corporate grocery stores like the Loblaws, Sobeys, and Metro, which are making record profits while people can't buy groceries, that is a, that is a, there's something wrong with that picture. We mm. want to go after that problem. And so our plan is let's put in an excess profit tax on those companies. Let's go after that greed and reinvest the revenue that we get from that back into people. Are you worried at all that increasing the tax, they'll pass that on to consumers, that grocery prices may end up going up Listen for the everyday this. person there? Well, the <laughs> way it would work is, is if they continue to increase their profits, then they're going to have to continue to pay even more mm -hmm. of an excess profit tax. Well, I, uh, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> this, is, this is the backward logic of uh, Jugmeet Singh. You know, we're, we're going to put in a tax where we're just arbitrarily say, you, you've made too much money. You've made too much money, so we're just going to tax some of that money away from you. And if if they decide that they're going to pay, you know, because anytime you 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 add a tax to an industry, what what happens? What happens when you add a tax to an industry? Just like the carbon tax, it gets passed on to the consumer. It's just going to get passed on to the consumer. So what does he say will happen if uh, oh if 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 you if you tax if you pass the tax on to the consumer? We're just going to tax you more. Now, that's a circular piece of logic right there. So if they just tax them more, what's it going to do? They'll just pass that on to the consumer. And then in order to, you know, deter them from doing it again, they're going to just tax them some more. It, it just, it's just going to raise food prices. It's stupid. The guy's a lunatic. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's just, he's absolutely like out to lunch. But, it, but again, these guys, they don't think past the singular transaction in an economy. They're transactional. That's it. You know, if if Loblaws made more money than they made last year, that's because they, uh, they're they they're cheating everybody. Oh, okay. Not, not because there's a million more mouths to feed in Canada this year than there was last year? Maybe, maybe... They have a million more customers than they had last year. Did they cause that? No. Revisades with two dollar super chat. Oh wait, and drive everyone out of business. Yeah, that's right. It's crazy, but that's the one thing that you'll never hear from anybody in the mainstream media or any of these guys, even even from the conservatives, saying like. You know, they made a lot a lot more money last year, this year than they did last year. Yeah, there's a million more people in the country buying food 
than there was last year. If you have a million more, and throw this one out on a limb, everybody that comes to the country eats food. I'm, I'm just going to throw that one out there. <laughs> all immigrants. I don't know. I don't usually, I don't usually make all encompassing statements of fact, but this one I'm going to throw out there. All immigrants eat food. In fact, I'm going to go out there even further. All people eat food. Yeah. It's, it really is crazy. It really is crazy, the stuff that you hear out of these people. It's absolutely insane. Two million more. Is there two million more? 96 billion more in grocery dollars. A grocery makes about three... A grocer makes about three dollars from every hundred dollars you spend. Yeah, the margins are so low. It's crazy. I'm getting blown out. The light is like increasing in the room here. Give me one sec. Turn that down. Turn the F stop down on the camera. <laughs> getting blown out. But yeah, no, it's it's it really is crazy. It really is crazy. Um tiniest margins. And it's funny because uh, you know, Jagmeet Singh's got this real hard on for uh for the CEO of Loblaws. Turns out his brother is the lobby lobbyist for Metro, uh, their competitor. Wow. Like, yeah, you can't make this stuff up, folks. It's crazy. It, it really is that. It's that crazy. <laughs> Three to five percent margins. It's so low. It's tiny. It's and it's no wonder that there's only these big grocers anymore. Like, gone are the days of these small mom and pop grocers. I mean, some of them are propping up, and, and I hope the best for them, always. But, yeah, holy cow. NG, National Grocer. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what they want at the end of the day. They want to have a government-run grocery store. What free market, LOL. Yeah, it was not much of a free market in Canada at the moment. It's crazy. Anyway, I have been going for two, hour, two hours and, and 20 minutes uh, almost at this point. Uh, longer than I usually go for my live streams uh, back home. I hope, I hope all you guys enjoyed this one. We're going to be back for another one next week. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I did an out and about last week. Uh, next week, before we go home, I might do another one outside. Depends on the weather, if the weather's nice. Um, the, the Sakura is in full bloom right now. So it'd be, it'd be cool to go back to Yoyogi Park, where we were last week. <laughs> what's up you statist what's up Clyde you statist <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, anything but um, great stream yeah thank you thank you guys um, thank you guys for all of that Ravi Sadie's with a last minute super chat uh, because the government um, uh, craziness Clyde is the big, big black horse under the cherry tree I don't I don't know the reference. I'm thinking of the the big Ferdinand, the big bull under the cork tree, but I don't know about that. Thanks for showing us cherry blooms. Yeah, well maybe ne maybe next week on on the same thing. So again, it's going to be another week of, you know, uh, sparse sparse videos. Uh we're going to try to do the the Marty up north uh video again. I hope you guys enjoyed the last one. Um and then also the live stream on Friday night. Can you drink wobbly pops in the street there? Yes, yes, you can. It's a favorite pastime of mine. Uh, <laughs> it's great. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, I'm uh, I'm gonna be jumping in the Discord for a little bit. I don't know how long because I'm gonna be taking my kids to the park as well. They're uh, they're watching cartoons at the moment. <laughs> 
See you next week, Clyde. And uh, yeah, of course, I'll see all of you as well next week. And uh, uh, hopefully over in the Discord as well. Uh, pay attention. Hopefully, hopefully it'll be Thursday um, uh, in the morning again. Hopefully we can work the timing out. Uh, but uh, Marty and I weekly roundup of what's going on in Canada. And then as well as... Uh, uh, the live stream next week hopefully and if the, if anything else happens i might do a short video here or there and um enjoy yakisoba i always enjoy yakisoba <laughs> i might go have some today all right everybody uh thanks for joining in and we'll see you guys all in the next one keep on tracking <laughs>